Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here once again with more amazing videos of Macedonian Wars. This is, you know, 214 to 205 BC. Uh, don't know if we've done this time period yet. This is, this is definitely way before the Caesar time, and I believe this is after Alexander the Great's time. Excuse me. So I'm, so I'm not sure exactly what's going on in the world at this time. Maybe I have done this time period just in a different area. I'm not sure. Uh, but like Macedonian, I, what I know for it is just like Alexander the Great. He was Macedonian, right? And uh, they live in you know Greece, right? Or at least the Greece area. And I'm not sure. I guess this is when Rome is kind of gaining steam. They're a republic right now. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly how powerful they are right now. So... First Roman intervention in the Hellenic Affairs. I don't know what the Hellenic Affairs is. So this will definitely be eye-opening as far as that concern. Because, yeah, no no idea. Right, to be honest, this is the Macedonian. It just it sounds cool. And, uh, yeah, I haven't done a video on the Macedonians uh, yet. So I figured, why not, right? Oh, I, I guess I have. I mean, Alexander the Great, right? Macedonian. So I guess I have. But, I don't know. You guys know me. I jump around from everywhere. Like, I just went from, like, 1000 you know ac <laughs> you're and then we'll call, and this is like 1200 years earlier so but that's just how we do it here we kind of like keep things interesting and fresh and, and and you know some people like other time periods more than others so i, I always I say a one time period for a couple of things and i jump back to a different time period that's just how we roll uh but yeah hope this is only four episodes you know just, it gets a lot easier to kind of do these small series, you know, before I jump into a, a giant one, which the only giant one, giant ones I really, that really left are, I think, uh, I think it was like the, like the Muslim expansion and Genghis, Genghis Khan, you know, because they're like 20 episodes and uh, I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, so I know keeping like... I don't know. I, I like the. I'm gonna jump into one of those, and but I'm just doing a bunch of small ones first, even because I know that that's probably not everyone's cup of tea or anything. But it's gonna happen because you guys know I'm gonna end up doing everything there is that, well, mostly everything that Kings and Generals has to offer, Hillary, History March has to offer because I relate those channels. So eventually, I'm gonna do everything on those channels. So if you're wanting me to do something from them. You pretty much just have to hold tight because you know, eventually I'm probably going to do whatever you're asking for. It's just a matter of time because, you know, they're my favorite channels and eventually I'll be done with them and then we we'll probably move it on to like newer channels, newer, newer, uh, newer horizons and stuff like that. So, yeah. Anyways, guys, we'll sit tight. Let's have some fun here and learn some cool stuff. And, yeah. And rocking my Geography Now t shirt. I know this is not geography. Uh, now it's. Uh, Kings and generals, but you know, I have done Macedonia and geography now. I know this is not the same Macedonia, right? I know the it's like a big controversy thing, right? Anyways, guys, let's jump to it. Please hit that like and subscribe button below, please, and thank you. And let's jump into it. Three, two, one. Bam. <laughs> Popular depictions of the Roman world often show us the picture during the late Republic or early Empire. But when did Roman domination of the Mediterranean basin become all but inevitable? How was it that Rome eventually grew to encompass the mighty Hellenistic kingdoms? And how did the legions come to establish themselves as the dominant military system for almost a millennia, overshadowing Alexander the Great's phalanx? You will learn about that in our new series on the Macedonian Wars. Wow. Yeah, this is really cool because eventually I'm going to have known done probably every video there is on the Romans. So I, I always I feel like oh, I'm going to be an expert when it comes to Rome after give me another year. I'll know everything. So I feel proud that I'm doing a lot of Roman stuff because <laughs> I think it's one of the coolest time periods there is. It, it just seemed like it was just fascinating, even though this is what really on Rome, right? It's the Macedonian Wars, right? So this is the beginning, I don't know, this is the beginning, so it's going to be kind of interesting to see them rise to power here. 
Lipsurf is a new free browser extension that lets you control the web with your voice. You can be requesting new features. Join us on the forum where you can be of continuous war started for free. So go do it via the link in the description. Yeah. The year is 231 BC and the Mediterranean world is a land of continuous warfare and political upheaval. I just want to pause it for a second. Look at that map. It's like a work of art. <laughs> we have Carthage down here, which you know a pretty good amount about. We got Roman Republic, which seems like to be in the center of the universe right here. Yeah, wait, who is this uh, Lucid Empire? I'm not sure. Um, Macedonia. I guess that's Macedonia right there. Greek city states. Okay, th this is not all combined yet. Do they ever? They get combined, right? Uh, that's just interesting. Like, yeah. It definitely makes sense that Rome has Rome has the power because look at all this coastline. And they seem to be in the middle of everything. How big it is. But anyways, yeah. Just want to stop and acknowledge how cool that map looks. The Mediterranean world is a land of continuous warfare and political upheaval. Just ten years earlier, the burgeoning power of the Roman Republic had defeated Carthage in the First Punic War. Established oh, it's right. We had the time because I've done the First Punic War, so definitely check that out. So awesome. So this is what are we doing here? This is after that, right? Cool. Cool. Piecing things together. Power of the Roman Republic had defeated Carthage in the First Punic War, yep. establishing naval dominance at sea. That's right. In the east, the Hellenistic kingdoms, Macedon, Ptolemaic Egypt, and the Seleucid Empire vie for dominance over their border territories. Sandwiched between these greater polities are a number of smaller states, such as Pergamon and the nominally independent Greek city-states. This is the world of the late 3rd century BC, but soon a series of conflicts between two rising powers, Rome and Macedon, will change the fate of the region forever. That's awesome. During this period, Illyria, which encompassed modern Albania and Dalmatia, was regarded as a thoroughly barbarian region, only half civilized by contact with its Hellenic neighbors. Though contact with the Greek world had led to a degree of urbanization in the south and along the coast, the region in a political sense was still made up of many small tribal chieftains. The population of Illyria had been regarded since their initial encounters as turbulent and warlike. From time to time, one of the many Illyrian tribes would gain temporary hegemony over most of the others, and in the 230s BC, this was the idea. A. Ruled by their energetic king Agron, they had forged a union of not just their own Illyrian peoples, but also prominent figures such as Demetrius, the Greek lord of Pharos. Okay. Coinciding with the rise of this new Illyrian power was the collapse of Epirus, whose once formidable strength had waned and whose monarchy fell. Taking advantage of this weakness, the Illyrians invaded, and eventually managed to seize Epirus territory far south of the traditional border, climaxing with the seizure of Phoenice, the wealthiest city of the kingdom. Despite these successes, however, Agron perished soon after and was succeeded nominally by his son. In reality, it was his wife Tuta who wielded true yeah. power, quickly being appointed regent for her stepson. Her ascension did not stop Illyrian belligerence, and in her reign, piracy increasingly became a major problem in the Mediterranean. Seizures of more southerly territories in Epirus had allowed the establishment of more staging points from which brigands could sail. This had been occurring for a long time already, but the increasing scale of the problem, the increasingly loud complaints of Roman merchants, and the economic impact of piracy on the Republic prompted the Senate to act. It's kind of cool, and it's interesting, you know, the pirate queen, you know, it's like, it's not just like pirates, I mean, they're an area like a country that that's what they do they're pirates so that, that's kind of that's kind of neat but of course if you're romeo is a power but i guess they're not the power that they end up becoming to be and so i guess they were too worried about i guess retaliation at that point and they and i guess they were pretty powerful at that point so they weren't too worried about the romans i guess but i guess eventually you know <laughs> you get you pirate too much man and 
the other side, man, it's really, it interferes with their lifestyle and everything. So Rome's like, dang, you guys are costing us here. We're going to have to stand up. And it looks like Rome was going to, you know, jump in the middle of this now. The economic impact of piracy on the Republic prompted the Senate to act. Uncharacteristically peacefully for the notoriously combative Romans, the initial senatorial reaction in 230 BC was not to send in the legions, but instead to send a diplomatic embassy of the Corincanius brothers to investigate the situation. Wow. In the typically harsh style of Roman diplomacy, the Corincanius brothers protested to Tutor about the increasing piracy and demanded that it cease immediately. The demand was not negotiable, and the Illyrians would have a chance to comply peacefully, otherwise it would be war. Tutor refused this demand, either because of her inability to control the actions of her decentralized tribal allies, or because she simply did not wish to bend to Roman demands. Whatever the case, this did not please the Romans, a situation made even worse by the murder of a Roman envoy, possibly wow. by Tutor herself in the midst of the anger of the meeting, or on the journey home by those very pirates that the embassy had been dispatched to stop. I mean, I, I guess I can't, you know, I, I didn't, there's no surprise at all that, you know, she didn't agree to it. I think they're kind of, kind of right. I, I think that if she agreed to stop, I don't think the rest of it, her country and then the other pirates, I don't think they would have listened to her. And it, showed, it would show a sign of weakness, you know, and yeah, I just, I just think that, you know, there's no way that they're going to do that. But Rome, that's what's cool about Rome. You know, Rome just didn't jump the gun and went just straight to war. You know, they 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 sent their diplomats there. You know, at least because at least then they can say, "Hey, we tried." You know, we warned you. You can't use this. You know, against us now because we you know we warned you guys. So, oh, the pirate queen, man, you in trouble. While the death of the Roman envoy was the immediate trigger for war, yeah. the expansion of the idea... It was a trigger for war. I mean, they were going to go to war anyway, even if they didn't get killed. But, I mean, that's just more of an great, even greater excuse to go to war. I mean, I think Rome at this time, didn't they, they want to expand? I mean, and I don't know. I think some countries, if they have a lot of power, they kind of look for an excuse to expand because they wanted to expand anyway. Like, okay, this is a great great time to you know we got a good good reason to expand now i mean we don't like these guys they're uh they're stopping us so anyways while the death of i apologize that there's noise in the background my kids are playing smash brothers and they get really into it anyways the roman envoy was the immediate trigger for war the expansion of the idea a tribe's power over the region was a deeper geopolitical cause Rome did not want any powerful rival in the Adriatic. Late in the campaigning season of 229 BC, a massive Roman force of 22,000 troops and 200 ships bore down on the Illyrians. Though details of the short campaign are lost, it is known that the Roman expedition was a complete success from north to south. Tutor's okay, appointed governor of the recently conquered island of Corcyra, Demetrius of Pharos, went over to the Roman side almost immediately, while the Queen Regent's forces were defeated in the field. By spring of 228, Tutor had been forced into a peace treaty with the Romans, breaking her kingdom into weaker segments and forbidding ventures of piracy into the southern Adriatic Sea. The Romans withdrew their troops and left behind only their amicitia or friendship, a benign sounding term which would soon apparently become anything but that. In essence, being a friend of Rome included the de facto conditions of becoming an informal client state. A primary beneficiary of the Peace of 228 was the defector Demetrius of Pharos, who was granted a small independent principality of his own sandwiched between the remnant of the Idaean kingdom and the Greek cities. Despite these gains under Roman auspices, it seems that the ambitious Demetrius was not content to remain in his small kingdom, and shortly after the peace was finalized, he married Trituta, the Idaean king's biological mother. By becoming the young boy's formal regent in this act, 
Demetrius of Pharos effectively recreated the powerful Illyrian kingdom abolished by Rome in the First Illyrian War. Huh. Even more boldly, he began to launch pillaging raids into the territory of Roman allied tribes. It could be that Demetrius was testing the water, and due to the lack of any Roman response, he believed they either could not or did not wish to intervene. This was an illusion, as the Romans were instead occupied by the Roman Gallic War of 226 to 222 BC, and it would prove to be a fatal illusion for Demetrius. Further trying his luck, Demetrius set out with 90 light galleys in the summer of 220 BC on a grand piracy expedition, wow. ravaging cities around the Adriatic Sea in blatant violation of the treaty eight years before. Man, he totally under underestimated Rome right now, man. I mean, like, they must, I guess, back then there was no internet to see, I guess, the power of Rome, I guess. So I guess he probably wasn't totally 100% sure, you know, what. I mean, he had to know they were powerful, but uh, I guess maybe, you know, they figured Rome already had their problems that, you know, they probably wouldn't think too much about him. Or maybe he was trying to egg him on. I don't know. I think he was just trying to get as much money and steal as much stuff as he possibly can. Uh, I don't think Rome is going to give him the uh, the same, I don't know, deal as a pirate queen. I don't think they're going to come and talk to him first. I think Rome's just going to go straight to like, uh, we're going to kill you. <laughs> so, wow, man. He got some, he's got some balls, man. He's going straight at Rome and pillaging their land. But uh, let's see how long this lasts now around the Adriatic Sea in blatant violation of the treaty eight years before. He had finally gone too far, and Rome yeah. decided that their former ally Demetrius now posed the same threat to Roman interests that Tutor had, and moreover, wished to punish their friend for betraying them and not acting like a friend should. The disproportionately massive Roman action which began in 219 was probably motivated by the Republic's desire to swiftly and decisively conclude the Illyrian situation before a new war with Carthage began, as it seemed like it might. Yep, it will. Demetrius's strategy was to hold the fortresses of Dimalum and Pharos itself, but the Romans took the former in only seven days, while a rash sortie by Demetrius lost him Pharos. The man himself evaded capture because he had placed a squadron of hidden galleys in a secret cove, fleeing to them when the battle was lost. On these huh. ships he fled to the south, abandoning his family to Roman imprisonment and his men wow. to death at Roman hands. Really? Not long after, Demetrius reached the Adriatic port town of Actium, where the fleet of a great Hellenistic king, Philip V of Macedon, was anchored. When he arrived, the king welcomed Demetrius heartily, and he quickly became a key advisor. Meanwhile, the Romans withdrew all of their soldiers from the region, leaving no military presence. They once again left only their friendship behind, but had demonstrated to the great Macedonian kingdom to the south that they had the will to intervene in the east. Before continuing, we need to reverse time for a moment and briefly examine the history of Macedon after its would-be conqueror, Pyrrhus of Epirus, died in Argos. Okay. The victor in that battle, Antigonus II Gonatus, was firmly in control of Macedon by 272, and had also established hegemony over the Greek city-states. Having gained the loyalty of his turbulent homeland, Antigonus II did his best to maintain it. He raised a great sacred mound to honour the graves of the Argead house, reorganised the provincial system to increase its efficiency, and was vigilant in keeping Macedonian coinage a high-quality currency. Making good use of Macedon's depleted resources and funds, Antigonus focused on access and mobility, extensively utilising the Antigonid fleet and the great naval fortresses of Demetrius, Chalcis and Corinth to ferry troops to strategic locations. An Athenian-led Ptolemy... You can correct me if I'm wrong, but like, you know, the, the Roman Republic, they're pretty advanced. But then, the, you know, the Greeks, I mean, Macedonia is basically... I don't know if it's Greece, but like, you know, the peninsula here, the 
know, Greece, Peninsula, whatever you want to call it here. I know it's a bunch of different, you know, tribes or countries right now. But the, like in this time period, right? Like they're the two areas that are kind of most advanced, right? Like, so but I guess the problem here for like Macedonia, like they're all kind of like separate tribes and they're not just, you know, being controlled by one voice or one Senate. So at least I'm at a disadvantage, but they have like, Carthage, right? They're, they're pretty advanced, right? You know, down there. So yeah, like, you basically have, it seems like you kind of have like, like this, this three powers. I mean, I mean, Greece, I guess isn't Greece yet, but, or I don't know. I'm trying to remember was Greece like more powerful early before this, or do they end up becoming powerful, more powerful? I think they end up becoming more powerful. I don't know, but you see like, like the trifecta here of like the big boys here and, you know, and everyone else is kind of just small players in this, you know, giant game, you know? So I don't know. It just seems, it's all, it just seems really cool. I don't know what my point was going to be. To ferry troops to strategic locations. An Athenian led Ptolemaic supported attempt at shaking off Macedonian domination failed in the Cremonidean War from 267 to 261. Though Antigonus managed to quell this revolt, crucial fortresses such as Acrocorinth were lost during his reign, which finally ended in 239 BC with his death. His successor, Demetrius II, ruled for a relatively uneventful decade, during which Macedon's situation weakened even further, and he died in 229. Yeah. The late king's own son, Philip V, was only a child at the time of his father's death, and Macedon could not afford a child ruler in such a perilous time. A regent was clearly required for the time being, and a distant Antigonid relation was chosen for the task, Antigonus Doson. As one of the lesser known but more highly competent Macedonian kings during the 3rd century BC, Antigonus Doson began to raise the young Philip as his own son, and at the same time energetically set to campaigning in order to beat back Macedon's enemies. Makes he sense. first marched north and expelled the Illyrians from the kingdom, and then struck south and crushed the Aetolian League. After securing his borders, Antigonus proceeded to renounce all Macedonian claims south of the Thermopylae Pass, wisely hoping to consolidate and stabilize the situation in Macedon itself. The response of the army was to demand that Antigonus accept the title of king. While he did this, Philip V's rights to the throne were not usurped or taken away, and Antigonus swiftly appointed him the official heir. Oh, okay, good deal. After another series of victories, which included I always wonder, you know, when there there is a, what's it called, uh, when the, the kid and the child is too young to rule and they have this, like, temporary leader, you know, to take their place. Everything it always goes through my mind is, like, man, they want to kill the kid and take full power because, they, you know, they don't want to just hand power back over after having all that power. I mean, they want to continue it. They just don't want to hand it over and be, like, go back to their regular old life. I mean, they want to keep power. So I always think that I always feel bad for, like, the child, you know, kings, because I always think that something bad's going to happen to them. <laughs> but in this case, you know, no, nothing bad happened to them, so that's good. I mean, it, it makes sense here. Like, use your land that you took over, but in the meantime, while the kid was growing up, I'm going to conquer this other area, so when you get old enough, I'll have my own area to be king of. I don't know. Did that, did that make any sense? Okay. The first... After another series of victories, which included the first ever seizure of Sparta by a foreign army, Antigonus III Doson perished in 221, leaving behind. I, I, I know the series on Sparta. You know, the only thing I've heard of Sparta is like the movie Troy. Wasn't that Sparta? Wasn't that movie? Movie Troy? I don't know. But yes, yeah, Sparta, I've definitely heard that, you know. So definitely, you know. Keep sure I remember that maybe for a future video if there's a cool video about Sparta. I don't know. For an army, Antigonus III Doson perished in 221, leaving behind a resurgent, stable, and increasingly powerful Macedon to Philip V, who now ascended to the throne. Here we Soon go. after taking the throne, Philip V and the Macedonian hegemony were once again challenged by the Aetolian League and its allies during the Social War of 220 to 217. 
the League believed Philip was too young to be an effective ruler. It was during this war that Demetrius of Pharos arrived at the royal court. Ah. Cataclysmic events in the West now began. I don't think Demetrius of Pharos can be trusted, though. I mean, he left his men, his family, basically to die by the Romans. So I think Philip should have eyes in the back of his head right now because, yeah, uh, this guy is basically like a pirate. And, you know, he's going to jump at any kind of opportunity to kind of probably take power from Philip or, you know, see some kind of opportunity. So, you know, Philip better beware, dude. Cataclysmic events in the West now began to attract wider attention in the Mediterranean world. The Second Punic War had broken out in 218, and the Carthaginian general Hannibal had successfully crossed the Alps to invade Italy. Yeah. There he had already defeated one Roman field army at the Trebia River, and in the June mm -hmm. of 217 he crushed another at Lake Trasimene in right. Etruria. Hearing of these massive Roman defeats, Philip V now began to consider expansion in the West at the expense of... This is so cool, man. I've done the Hannibal series, so if you're new to my channel, definitely check that out. That series is completely amazing, and Hannibal's awesome. And I'm so happy now, because I was in... Like, all these, these past series, I always forget what timeline they're in, like. And so it's kind of really cool that, you know, the first Pink War ended, and this kind of this kind of this kind of war kind of begins, and then you have the second Punic War starting, and so there's so much going on at the same time, and it's exciting to see because you already know exactly what's going to go on with Hannibal as he comes down here. To but it's really cool to see what's going on over in the east over here, you know, with Macedonia. So yeah, this is this is really cool, exciting stuff, guys. You know, it's like a puzzle coming together, you know. Like the more and more videos I do, how everything's more and more connects. It's just so cool. Feats. Philip V now began to consider expansion in the West at the expense of an apparently dying Roman Republic. This new direction was encouraged by Demetrius of Pharos, who, after being expelled from his Adriatic dominion by Rome, now argued that Philip should end the social war, gain control of the Illyrian coast, and attack Italy himself. Wow. This is a real B&H um, customer story. I, uh, Jack and Barbara, professional this, uh, wildlife uh, photographers and B&H customers. I don't think it's a good idea anyway, because, Philip, if you attack, just say Hannibal does win, you know, and takes over Italy. You think Hannibal's going to allow that? No. So whoever comes out on top, you know, of the second punic war they're gonna they're gonna destroy you because you know right so i'm sorry right now the macedonians they're, they're not apparently obviously not as powerful as carthage and the republic and so i don't think it's very wise uh to kind of listen to this guy who wants you to invade italy because he's just after revenge and you know whatnot he could care less about your whatever your your well-being philip you know he just wants chaos really <laughs> but anyways yeah accepting the military status quo and ending the war in greece at nalpactus philip then drove the illyrians from macedon once again and in the winter of 217 had a fleet of 100 light warships constructed okay. in the summer of 216 the king made his first attempt at securing Illyria's coastal region, but fled home upon hearing news of an approaching Roman fleet. The decisive Roman defeat at Cannae was another crucial moment, as it prompted Philip to send envoys to Han- I gotta stop, I'm sorry guys, but that Cannae battle is amazing. Like, even if you're not interested, you know, in, uh, if you even though you're not interested in like the Hannibal series, guys, check out the Battle of Cannae. Like, go back, and go through the like the playlist, the Hannibal playlist, and scroll down that Battle of Cannae. That's probably the the best battle you'll ever witness, ever. Like, what went down in that battle is it, just amazing. So, you know, I'm just saying, do yourself a favor, and hey, even pause this video right now, open a new tab, pull up the Battle of Cannae or Cannae. And watch that first. You will not regret, I swear. 
it's because it, it's you know it's perfection you know it's just amazing so i just wanted to say that before we continue feat at Cannae was another crucial moment, as it prompted Philip to send envoys to Hannibal asking for a formal alliance. He no doubt wanted to join the winning side and make gains at Roman expense. The story goes that the envoy Xenophanes was captured by a Roman praetor on his way to speak with Hannibal, but managed to talk his way to freedom by stating that he was instead there to make peace with Rome. However, the unfortunate Xenophanes was captured again on his way back to Macedon with the formal treaty with Hannibal in his possession. Wow. It was in this manner that the Romans learned of the new threat that faced them. Wow. Following the conclusion of the Punic Macedonian Treaty, Philip aggressed further with new attacks against coastal Illyria, attacking Corcyra in 215. This intensified in 214 when a major offensive began. Philip's land army marched north into Illyria through Epirus, while 120 Macedonian galleys sailed up the Straits of Otranto. In this campaign, Philip swiftly seized Oricum and besieged Apollonia, who called to Rome for help. With a strengthened Adriatic fleet, the Roman commander Levinus now crossed the sea with 55 heavy Roman warships, lifted the siege of Apollonia, and drove the Macedonians away from Oricum, two wow. crucial ports which could have been used as a staging point for an attack on Italy. After these victories, Levinus wintered his fleet in Oricum, while Philip burned his ships and retreated overland to Macedon. Damn. Having been blocked at sea, the Macedonian king attacked instead over the Pindus Mountains, making significant gains in 213 and 212. The inland Dasaretis, Athini and Atintani tribal settlements fell to him without a significant Roman response. The Republic did not have the land troops to spare for a side venture into the eastern Adriatic, as they were still fighting against Hannibal. This situation changed during the later part of 212, when Philip was once again able to reach the Adriatic. Having battered his way over land to the coast, he managed to seize the coastal fortress of Lissus, another possible staging point. It became clear to the Romans that this eastern threat could no longer be ignored. Yeah, nope. Neutralizing Philip at this point was beyond Roman military power alone due to the Carthaginian War. So the Senate began to use diplomacy as a weapon, and started enticing other Greek states to do the neutralizing for them. A treaty was made between the traditionally anti-Macedonian Aetolian League and Rome, the former being convinced of the alliance because of Roman victories in the Punic War during the summer of 211 at Capua and Tarentum. Terms were generous for the Aetolians. They would get any captured town or city, but the booty would go to the Romans unless the town was jointly taken. Another term allowed for the inclusion of other Aetolian allies, such as Sparta, Elis, Messenia, the Illyrians, and even Pergamum. Wow. The war itself was a disruptive, indecisive slogging match, with the Romans taking several important centres, such as Antichora, but Philip V making gains against the rest of the coalition. Attempts at peace talks by non-combatant states failed in 207 due to Rome's deliberate derailing actions, but during 206 and 205 they were gradually forced into peace. Though the final treaty ending the war at Foenike concluded hostilities for now, it was clear that Rome's desire to punish Philip for his attempt at kicking them while they were down was not yet sated. One thing was certain, however, Rome was ever so slowly winning the Second Punic War, and would soon be able to harness all of its might against Macedon. Damn. New videos in our series on the Macedonian Wars are on the way, so make sure you Yeah, uh, kicking while they're down, I mean, that shit, that just goes hand in hand with, you know, taking advantage of a situation. I mean, that, that, you could, there's so many, like, you know, countries and, you know, leaders that have done the same thing, you know, if you want, you know, you're trying to take over something, you go after your enemy when they're, you know, most vulnerable, you know, it just makes perfect sense. And, uh, you know, Philip was, you know, try basically trying to do the same thing. Uh, I think, uh, 
got himself more in trouble from listening to that, that pirate dude, I forget his name is, because I, I figured that, you know, instead of Philip trying to, you know, attack Italy, wouldn't it make more sense for him just to kind of go after that league down south there and try to control that area and gain a big piece of land there and, you know, before going across the sea at Rome, it just seems like it's better for them just to, you know, gain more power over there while they keep at peace with Rome. Excuse me. And then later on, you know, kind of uh, going after Rome. I don't know. Like, this is only the first episode. So, uh, obviously, you know, for this to be the Macedonian Wars, I mean, Macedonia's got to have some fight in them, right? So, Macedonia War, uh, I don't know what that is. I uh, don't know what that is, but anyways, guys, uh, definitely uh, a very exciting and definitely, you know, uh, I'm definitely happy with choosing to do this score. This because how it coincides, you know, with the other uh, videos I've done, other series I have done, Second Punic Wars, you know, and Hannibal, you know, it's just Rome and every, everything. Yeah, this uh, part, you know, the world, it's just, I guess it's just really exciting. There's so much going on and everything. But anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe below. Hope you guys really enjoyed this video and hope you guys continue on with the journey with me here. It's only it's only four videos, guys. Come on now, hang in there and let's like see some cool stuff, right? This is a, you know, a very fun time in history, at least for us to look back on. I'm sure living it probably wasn't so fun, but you know what I'm saying. So anyways, that's it. Uh, catch you guys in future videos. Uh, I guess have an amazing day, amazing weekend. It's a uh, Saturday evening as I'm recording this. And so, yeah, I think I'm going to enjoy, probably try and enjoy my Saturday evening. And, yeah, I'm going to go play some Smash Brothers with my kids who are killing each other. But anyway, guys, peace. You guys have a great night. I am out of here.